I'm Jacob Moore. I'm the assistant director of the Temple Horn Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture here at GSEP, which is right over at uh, Buell Hall next to the chapel. Um, so together with, uh, first I need to thank Lila and Lucy and Stefan from the events office, um, but also the Urban Planning Program, Urban Design, Historic Preservation, Center for Spatial Research, um, and all of their various team members. Um, it was a real group effort to get this thing pulled together. Um, in particular, as a Buell team member, I need to thank uh, Reinhold Martin, Jordan Steingard, um, Eddie Almonte, Alicia French, Jajin Lin, and Maria Linares, who are, that's the Buell team. Um, and so just really quickly to set up, um, Geo Center does a uh, uh, multi-year thematic research projects, um, and our current project is called Power Infrastructure in America, um, and it uh, has provided some of the institutional context for the event today, so I thought I would just describe a little bit about that project before handing it off to uh, the moderators and the, and the presenters. So, um, extending and further developing 10 years of work on the interrelated materials, systems, and discourses of housing and real estate development. With Power Infrastructure in America, as you might gather from its name, the Buell Center is thinking critically about many of those same houses. Uh, but rather than walking in through the door, we're flowing in through the pipes, wires, and ducts that crisscross their thresholds, and flowing back out again to the treatment facilities, Excel sheets, and sloganeering that both define and stress those buildings' capacities. In particular, we've been interested in the ways in which emergencies um, which is a hard to define category, but we'll leave it loose for now, um, in which emergencies expose infrastructures at work. Most spectacularly, uh, sometimes during emergencies, infrastructures break down, and it's their not working that demands attention. More often, however, and usually much less spectacularly, emergencies tend to intensify and accelerate processes already long underway, literally through the infrastructures at hand. In Flint, Michigan, the executive definition and declaration of emergency financial management led to the uh, uh, disenfranchisement of the town's majority black population by a majority white state government, and subsequently through, among other things, the municipality's water pipes, to at least 12 deaths and the lead poisoning of thousands more Flint residents. In New Orleans, Louisiana, concentrated poverty and constrained ecological imagination, among other things, allowed through the city's levees uh, for at least 1,800 deaths and a more pernicious transformation of the region's demographics and landscape than was otherwise guaranteed. And here in New York, real estate interests, public authorities, and architects responded to nearly 3,000 deaths and the imperatives of the so-called global war on terror through, among other things, the site's slurry walls and subway tunnels with the making and monetizing of sacred ground. As of the spring and summer of 2017, the Buell Center planned to study these infrastructures and others, with special attention paid not only to their similarities, but also, importantly, to their differences, and this plan persists. However, in late September of 2017, in its bracing, bracing exposure of infrastructure at the convergence of neoliberalism, colonialism, and relentlessly warming oceans, the unnatural disaster known as Hurricane Maria has made the urgency of working across categories and across disciplines uh, ever more clear. So in this spirit, uh, here at this most interdisciplinary of schools, um, I'm going to introduce Hiba uh, Buakar, who is going to moderate together with Montreal Lopez the uh, discussion at the end, um, and she'll introduce everyone else. So uh, Hiba Buakar is uh, assistant professor here in the Department of Urban Planning at GSEP. Her recent book, With a War Yet to Come, Planning Beirut Frontiers, which was released this year at Stanford University Press, examines how Beirut's post-Civil War peripheries have been transformed through multiple planning exercises into contested frontiers that are mired in new forms of conflict. Buakar received her PhD from University of California, Berkeley, and she holds a Bachelor of Architecture from the American University of Beirut, and a Master in City Planning from uh, Mass uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So I'll hand it to Eva and to the Jacob, thank you for the Buell Center. I'm, I'm so glad that we're having this conversation here today because we at GSAP with our architecture, urban planning, urban design, and historic preservation programs, 
strive to be at the forefront of these critical conversations and actually need to be at the forefront of these conversations of our time, especially that these natural crises are in fact very much human made. Crises like Hurricane Maria highlight not only the detrimental effect of climate change, but also the long histories of how our fields, such as planning, architecture, development, and policy, play the primary role in the colonization, dispossession, and disinvestment and exclusion of places like Puerto Rico, rendering them unable to recover from disasters, and leading to worsening living conditions and new forms of displacement. Yet at the same time, while acknowledging these histories, we are called upon to participate in improving the living conditions before and when and after such crises happen, and to help conceive of a different future that is more inclusive, equitable, and resilient. So we have an am amazing panel today here to discuss these issues, and um, I will go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, Moncho Lopez is a researcher, a professor, cartographer, and South Bronx-based environmental and urban justice activist. He teaches Latino and ethnic politics at Hunter College, and is a mapping fellow at the Design Trust for Public Spaces. Moncho also, also is a founding member of South Bronx Unite, a local urban and environmental justice organization, and founding member and one man Mem board member of the Mount Haven Port Morris Community Land Stewards, the local community land trust. He holds a PhD in political science from CUNY's Graduate Center and an MA from Université Laval in Quebec, Canada. His academic research revolves around spatiality, mapping, social justice, political theory, and Latino communities. Lopez's political writings on spatial and social justice have been published in Salon, Latino Rebel, and Macla, among other media outlets. And his activist work has been profiled by New York Times, Urban Omnis, and de la Serra. He was born and grew up in Puerto Rico and currently lives in Mount Haven, the South Bronx. Next, we move to uh, uh, Iba, Iba, Ives Garcia Zambrana, is an assistant professor in city and metropolitan planning at the University of Utah. He has spent time as a professional planning in Albuquerque, New Mexico, San Francisco, California, Springfield, Missouri, Washington, D.C., and Chicago, where she was the co chair of the city's larger Puerto Rican organization, the Puerto Rican Agenda. She's currently writing a book on Puerto Ricans in Chicago, which is under contract with Central Press. Dr. Garcia also chairs Planners for Puerto Rico, a group of academic and practitioners, uh, practitioner planners from ACSP, APA, FEMA, Centro, UPR, and Society for Puerto Rican Planner, among others that are collaborating in recovery, recovery efforts in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. She was recently elected a board member of the National Puerto Rican Agenda, with a non, which is a nonpartisan alliance <coughs> to address Puerto Rico's humanitarian crisis and promote Puerto Rican political and civic participation in the United States. She earned her PhD in urban and civic participation uh, she, she, in, in urban planning and policy from the University of Illinois at Chicago. She holds dual degrees from the University of New Mexico in community and region planning and Latin American studies and bachelor in environmental sciences from Inter-American University of Puerto Rico. Marcelo Lopez Dinardi is an immigrant researcher and educator interested in the various tales of design in the practice of architecture as research and the intersection of architecture and political economy. He's an assistant professor of architecture at Texas A&M University. As partner of an A office, well, uh, as partner of an A office, was elected to represent the United States Pavilion in the 2016 Biennale, Venice Architecture Biennale, and later selected as a fellow for Idea Cities Athens uh, and others, an event organized by the New York City New Museum. Uh, has written for April Review, the Arcanite Arch newspaper, uh, Domo's Planning Perspective, Art Forum China, and lectured at Cooper Union, Princeton University's Brisbane, among others. He completed a Bachelor in Architecture from the Polytechnic University of Puerto Rico and LMS in Critical Creator and Conceptual Practice of Architecture here at Columbia GSA. Mark Martin Brass is the Director of Community Relations and Research at the Vicas Convert. Uh, uh, Conservation and Historical Trust and the co-founder of Vicas Lab, both are non-profits. Uh, uh, non His research focuses on um, bilum, I'm not going to be able to say that. <laughs> okay, you <on> Facebook <laughs> <laughs> and sea turtles with the White Vice Laboratory. After Maria, Martin took a leadership role of the Emergent Response and Recovery by connecting outside resources and local entities to provide solutions. He became a facilitator and coordinator for the complex response system, providing logistics, resources, translation, and coordination for government and private entities. He is an EPA environmental champion recipient, a member of the board of Scantis, and the president of the board of Greco Silva and Educational Foundation. 
Andreas Magnucci is a Puerto Rican architect, urbanist, and educator. He is the recipient of the National Architecture Prize in Architecture, a fellow of the American Institute of Architects, and the Henry Club Award Literate. His recent publications include Conversations with Forms, Supports Housing and City, and Bruno's Techno and Architecture for the Tropics. Magnucci has been selected as the Rockefeller Foundation Arts and Literary Arts Fellow and 2019 Scholar in Resident at the Bellagio Center developing a research project entitled Common Ground, Public Space, and the Resilient City. Magnucci teaches at the School of Architecture at the University of Puerto Rico and is principal of Andreas Magnucci's Architecture. Francis Magran Montaner is a filmmaker, writer, curator, scholar, and professor at, the University, at Columbia University, where she's also founding curator of the Latino Arts and Activism Archive. Among her books and publications, are Puerto, uh, Puerto Pop, Puerto Ricans and the Latinization of American uh, Culture, the Latino Media Cap, and Sovereign Acts, Contesting Colonialism in Native Nations, and Latinx America. Her most recent films include Small City Big Change, War from Guam, and Life Outside. For her work as a scholar and filmmaker, Negro Montaner has received four Truman Rockefeller and Poe Fellowships. In 2008, the United Nations Rapid Response Media Mechanism recognized her as a global expert in the area of mass media and Latino American studies. She's also the recipient of the Lenses Award, one of Colombia's most prestigious recognition for excellence in teaching and scholarship. She has also served as the director for the study of ethnicity and race from 2009 to 2016. And lastly, Ingrid Olivio is an urban planner and architect with over 20 years experience combining policy and advisory work research and teaching. She was recently an associate researcher for Columbia Center for Urban Disaster uh, Risk, Reduction and Resilience and an Urban Studies Foundation postdoctoral fellow. And is currently a coordinator with Ecuador's Sustainable Secondary Cities Program. Olivia has worked with NGOs, private firms, universities, multinational and public institutions, receiving support from, from institutions such, uh, such as the British Council, Fulbright, UNESCO, Organization of American States. She has received her, uh, her doctorate from urban planning from Columbia GSA. So, amazing panel. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi, everybody. <laughs> so, I'm going to start uh, from a strange place. Um, for the French Algerian uh, writer and philosopher Albert Camus, the only important philosophical question was suicide. Was life worth living given the injustices, the cruelty, the pain, and the patent absurdity surrounding all of us? For Camus, the response was always yes. Struggle was always the only option, but is that the case with the situation in Puerto Rico? I'm going to be a little bit dramatic, but this is what I think the situation in Puerto Rico boils down to. Is Puerto Rico worth saving and fighting for? I'm not talking about Puerto Ricans, because obviously we are human beings, and Puerto Ricans, like every other human being on the planet, uh, have rights and we are supposed to possess uh, human rights. But are Puerto Ricans worth saving in Puerto Rico? Is Puerto Rico worth saving for Puerto Ricans? Is saving and fighting for Puerto Rico and saving and fighting for Puerto Ricans the same thing? These are uncomfortable questions, existential questions, and I think that some of the possible answers to those questions are already out there, and many of us do not like what we hear. The massive exodus, pre and post Maria signals precisely at the decoupling of Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico. It reminds us, one more time, that you can save one and let the other go down under. That we can save Puerto Ricans, meaning have massive numbers of refugees, while saving the island, apparently, for non-Puerto Ricans. Why does this feel possible? It feels so likely. It is the plan that doesn't include us, but it also feels so wrong. I think that the answer is because we automatically couple 
people and places. For the simple reason that people usually build the places they habitat. In most colonial cases, however, this equation of people and places is not as straightforward. And Puerto Rico is a colonial case. Infrastructure, the built infrastructure and the institutional infrastructure of colonies does not work in normal ways. In colonies, infrastructure is hardwired to produce colonial subjects and reproduce colonial dynamics. And again, given that Puerto Rico and its infrastructure is in general of a colonial nature, the question is again, is this infrastructure worth saving and fighting for? Can we really delink the colonial aspect from our infrastructures? Can we build truly the colonial things from within a thoroughly colonial environment? The answer to this might be complicated, but I believe it must be yes. Today we need to sketch potential ways to transmute the colonial into the decolonial, to transmute dependency into independence, and to try to answer the question of why and how Puerto Rico must be safe for Puerto Ricans and for other of our brothers and sisters from uh, the Caribbean. It means that we must begin our, our conversation fully aware of the colonial stew, la sopa colonial, as they call it, uh, that in which we find ourselves. Um, the key operative word here is work. Because most folks I know, and most activists I know, can recite the colonial land release of what's wrong in Puerto Rico by heart. What we need to uh, have a conversation is, the real crisis for me, is not a crisis of information. We know, in general, what's going on in Puerto Rico. The crisis revolves around what, how, and why we are built, or we're going to unbuild, whatever needs to be built or unbuilt in Puerto Rico. This is why I talk about infrastructure is important, because I feel it frames our discussion around a trope of action rather than around a trope of information and data. Information and data are important, and the more we have, the better. Yet, I think that we know most of what we need to know to get our outrage and organizing going. I am known as a kind of internal joke by some people as Moncho Watts. Okay. <laughs> right after the hurricane, uh, I got called by, by my sister uh, asking me, she told me that uh, she was having, going through a, an asthma attack and she told me like the, the oil generators are going to kill me. So I, I need you to find out about how solar works, I need you to, to build a, a prototype, an inexpensive one, I, I want you to gather like, all the information, all the know-how you can, so, so we can like, um, uh, share that information uh, in Puerto Rico. When, when I started uh, doing this, I didn't know anything about solar, about watts, about amperage, about volts, uh, nothing uh, of the sort. But this last week, with the knowledge, the know-how that I acquired, I was uh, installing like a rather large solar array system in a community garden uh, in the South Bronx based on the knowledge of, uh, that, that I acquired while working in, in Puerto Rico. While I worked on that prototype, I uh, thought about what I was doing uh, from an overly political perspective. I tried to think about my efforts uh, within a decolonial frame. I wrote about it, I published some stuff about it, but my main emphasis was and will remain organizing action to change the material conditions that, to paraphrase your lipsits, determine how dependence takes place. Meaning I want to investigate and act on how the built environment reproduces dependence. The key here is that I was in Puerto Rico uh, in August, and the natural infrastructure, you know, is doing just fine. 
what is still down and not working as it should work is the built uh, infrastructure. Uh, and, and so we need to somehow uh, figure out how to reproduce in a way not only the resiliency but the, the, the redundancy and the, and the fortitude of that natural infrastructure that was uh, in a way has evolved uh, around uh, hurricanes. Like we were traumatized by the hurricane but somehow the, our nature uh, wasn't. Um, I think that one of our own insights that living in the diaspora gives us is how planning and architecture have been used here in our cities to breed dependence and displacement from the top. The planning is done to us here in the cities. I am personally involved in efforts here uh, and in Puerto Rico to organize communities around community land trusts, uh, fideicomisos, mechanisms that allow communities to develop the tools for planning and building their own infrastructure. I am sure that our panelists today will give us food for thought on these matters about different modalities of planning, recovery efforts, etc. Also, there is the question of preservation and the archive. What do the archives of wounded places like Puerto Rico look like? Can we have a healthy archive in a place that is emptying out? I believe I'm not the only one to feel that our recent massive exodus from Puerto Rico is the wound that subsumes all other wounds. The exodus is, in a sense, the metonymy for the sad state of the island. How bad is the situation in the island? People ask me, I usually reply, hundreds of thousands of people have left since uh, the hurricane. It is difficult to shake off the impression that this exodus that sometimes healthy individuals and individual families survive is at the same time an open wound that prefigures what Frances calls the empty island la isla que se vacía scenario. Puerto Rico without Puerto Ricans or paradise for developers. It is for that reason that I'm convinced that our diasporas are an essential part of the conversation about Puerto Rico, that our experiences here are relevant and might be helpful in dealing with the situation down in Puerto Rico and vice versa, that our refugees and the conditions under which they have fled have lots to teach us about the potential roles of action for our diasporic communities here in the U.S. A conversation on the legal, human, and built infrastructure in Puerto Rico is a necessary one both for the future of Puerto Rico, but also for the sake of building uh, healthy communities here uh, in exile. I'm going to end with a, with a personal uh, note. Like, uh, I am from Puerto Rico. And uh, one of the things that I am, uh, <laughs> my is off, that I'm really concerned about is the, is the idea that, that we don't let ourselves and the history of our island be defined uh, by the tragedy of the hurricane. Uh, I think that it's important that we talk about what happened. I think that we are all, in a way, in a treatment. Uh, and talking about it is a way of walking through that trauma. That being said, I feel it's really, really important that we don't let ourselves be defined by this and that we uh, allow ourselves to be defined by, by the way that, that we are responding, not only to the tragedy of the hurricane, but also uh, to, the, to the human made catastrophe, the man made catastrophe of the financial crisis in the world. So I guess today I'm going to talk about um, housing, and I'm going to talk about infrastructure. I don't know if you guys uh, know that of the hundred billion dollars um, that uh, Puerto Rico will receive, um, there's like about 30 percent or 31 billion dollars that are going to go to housing. So they are going to go to economic development, to um, the general infrastructure. It's like twice as much um, that is going to go for the electric bill. Um, but in particular, I'm going to be talking about um, informal housing and how people were not. Um, able to prove um, ownership. Uh, so I would need like a little bit of background about informal housing in Puerto Rico, some case studies of people that were not able to obtain assistance from, P from FEMA, and then some policy uh, recommendations. Um, in terms of the methods, I joined the Disaster Recovery Coalition. They have like weekly talks from the National Informal Housing um, Coalition. 
and uh, I, I worked previously with, with them, and like through them I met Ayuda Legal, Huracan Maria, um, you probably heard of them. And uh, once I went to Puerto Rico, I'm going to be there for a year, um, I went to the public workshops and have conversations with them, and they have been using some uh, case studies, so there's different case studies, some of them that they use for media and, and other ones. Um, so the question is like how the requirement for proof of ownership in the applications or the appeals of female individual and household grants became a barrier for thousands of Puerto Ricans who live in Ontario or um, land or homes. And most importantly, um, it's like how this barrier could be um, overcome. So to give you some background, there's uh, 1.2 uh, million homes in Puerto Rico, and 92 of those receive like some damages. So in terms of like a lot of damages, like more like 300,000 and 70,000 that were like completely uh, lost homes. Um, then of those that applied for FEMA, it was like 98 um, percent, and those could be for also like personal um, property. Um, in terms of like the, the decisions of FEMA, 40% uh, were approved, so that's like 1.39 billion in grants. Uh, that means that 60% were not approved. Um, uh, there was like 30% that were ineligible and 30% that were um, denied. And of course, you can always appeal, but even for people who appeal, 18% were approved and 82% uh, were not. So that's like an eligibility rate of like 75%. So there's the scale of informality in, in Puerto Rico. Um, so there's a lot of informal construction with no permits and non-conformance in land use codes. That's about like 45 to 55 percent. Um, so there's different ranges and uh, 20 percent of uh, people do not have any deeds. There could be like 41 codes that people could be denied, um, insufficient damages, or like there was some kind of persisting condition. Uh, people simply could not be contacted on the phone, or when they sent a letter, they didn't get it. There was also inconsistency, like some people have electric bills in one address, they have phone bills in another address, and uh, no proof of ownership is about um, 15%. So in terms of informal practices, you might uh, divide them in like building, um, but also like occupying. Um, it could be with permission or without, right? So for uh, without permission, it's like rescue land, that's how um, people call it. Um, and most of the times it's like city owned. Uh, but it could also be that um, you uh, build a home where your family um, has land um, or maybe you have permission from the government or from an NGO to be there. Um, in terms of occupying, it could be a state um, of taking or you can be a hair. There's something else that um, is the good faith. Um, so that means that somebody told you that you know it was okay to live in this place and um, you, you believe that it could be related to, to you or not. Um, so a little bit of more background uh, because there's also informal housing in the United States and there was a case um, from uh, Mark Waters versus FEMA, it was a loose, uh, lawsuit of residents of Louisiana, Mississippi and Alabama and in this case um, FEMA denied them assistance based, based on um, them having like the, uh, the same address or also sharing a phone. Um, and then the court decided that FEMA uh, was um, right because they were just trying to prevent fraudulent um, duplication uh, or fraudulent behavior. And the recommendation was that um, they they should be more inclusive in the future and ask for for their um, do documentation. Um, so these are like some people that were denied of assistance. Uh, we have, for example, Fernando and. Um, he bought this land like uh, 20 years ago, he built his own home, but he bought it like for $1,500 and there was no uh, contract. And this happens a lot in Puerto Rico, there's like, no, no, no contract uh, at all, there could be a Robert verbal um, agreements. Um, there's uh, Roberto that um, he lives in, in the home that um, his mother, mother used to have, but his mother passed away. Um, there's other ways that you can also try to prove ownership and might be like through electric bills or water bills, but he kept the water and electric bills under his mother. Um, then we have this, it's very common case, which is the land um, segregation. So you have multiple homes in like a single family um, a land. And uh, in this case, a lot of people got just $500 for their damages in 
in their home, so it will be more like treated as a renter that lost some, some uh, things, but <coughs> not really uh, fix uh, their, their homes. Um, there's some cases in where people are in unrelated um, land, so it's not land that belongs to the family, but this, for example, is Jose's case that um, his mother built a land um, in the, um, it was the, his grandfather's employer. Um, so, and this was like a, a, a agreement between gentlemen 50 years ago, um, so he could not uh, prove that this was his home. Um, this also happens a, a, a lot in where you have um, two households in one, one family, so you just build on top of like the, some other house. And in this case, there's like two brothers, and uh, because of this rule of the um, church house um, rule, um, the brother got assistance because he, got the, he sent the application first. Um, but then his brother, uh, Waldemar, could not get assistance because he was, again, trying to prevent uh, fraudulent uh, behavior. They could not prove that they are a separate um, nuclei. Um, there's other cases, like in Villas del Sol. Um, this is like 221 families um, living in this community that 50 years ago, the government uh, took them from informal settlements and then say, you know, it's OK to live in this um, housing. Um, for land that belongs to us, and there was an NGO that was taking care of the of the land. But again, these families cannot prove that um, they they are owners. Um, in terms of like the policy, so the lawyers uh, from the National Income Housing Coalition, what they were doing is like trying to look at uh, what were some of the definitions of ownership in the United States in terms of like federal law, and also look at um, Puerto Rico as treated as a state um, and. The, in, in the U.S., you could be the legal owner, but also you can not have no title, um, but then prove that you have um, are maintaining a place or you are paying taxes, and also you could be a heir. So based on this, the federal law should be able to um, they should be able to prove they are um, owners. So the there was a creation of a source statement, um, and this was actually creation also with um, with like uh, people from FEMA. And it was approved in August 6, um, and it doesn't have to be notarized. So that was like a major thing because in, in Puerto Rico, um, the notaries, you cannot go to the FedEx, right? You have to have to get a lawyer to like, sign um, this for you. Um, and then you could provide several supporting documents in, in any way um, that you could to prove like maintenance, inheritance, or, or possession. However, this, is, this was not a FEMA document. So what that meant? It meant that they put a press release, but they didn't attach um, the form. Um, it meant that they didn't train the um, DRC staff on the availability of this. They just like, presented like, this is another alternative. And then all the work of like uh, passing around this and telling people, it was on the nonprofits like Ayuda Legal Ruta Maria, which is mostly volunteers. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is what they are doing. They're like, I have gone back and forward with uh, FEMA staff to um, get them to notify staff, to train staff on the form, to notify the applicants. They also have tried to see if they can get the addresses of people, the phone number, so they can um, call them. And they have got them to try to um, extend the deadline. The next step is they're looking into like a class uh, lawsuit. Um, to see if they actually um, can get them to, to do these things. In terms of other policy uh, solutions, the, um, of the $18.5 billion that will come to Puerto Rico in the form of CDBD DR funds, um, $40 million are going to go to give titles um, to people. The government already received 10 proposals for this. We don't know like who are those. I don't know if you know that. It's kind of kept secret. And then um, the idea is that they will actually give um, titles to 48,000 people that the government knows that do not have um, any titles. So thank you very much. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. Thanks to GS Happy Bill Center and all the organizers for the, uh, the invitation. I'm super happy to be back. Uh, I'm going to talk about debt, text, and images and how they perform as infrastructure data for a current scenario. 
with specializing in that initial party. And I'm afraid I've been trying to understand Federico's death in order to localize it. It was inevitable to consider this within the context of the 130 years of Puerto Rico's history under the ruling of the United States. I want to start with this map, the first of the ones I made and will be presented today, that shows an overall timeline of US President's visits to Puerto Rico in order to stress the tension between territory legal frameworks and their impact. There have been six official visits out of 21 presidents, some of them lasting less than four hours, some for fundraising, and some unofficial visits as layovers or to vacation. Overall, the official visit does not sum more than 200 hours or the equivalent of a 40 hours full-time work week. <laughs> However, the impact they have had on the island currently extends indefinitely in time. At the bottom, a yellow bar shows the extent of the current debt that I will briefly recount. I've also inevitably encountered things visually, which is, has been one form of constructing <laughs> cultural imaginaries, I will suggest, as infrastructural products themselves. The Spanish-American War coincided with the booming of yellow journalism, which produced a great amount of imagery that in many ways passed to impress ideas of these other territories, factual or not, and circulated media in general served as a principal tool to learn about them. The Judge magazine cover of August of 1895 shows the map as image, as powerful narrative building image, combining territorial coordinates and visual imagery. Puerto Rico, the center of the discussion, is not included in it. This image precedes the Spanish-American War, where Puerto Rico was first half a shadow, an extra more than a main cast character. Cartoons also circulated beyond New York. This time, Puerto Rico was included with a map combat. However, these images started to acquire a graded reality at every step. Men seated at tables in remote places formalized these realities and circulated for everyone's knowledge. Puerto Rico has been ceded to the United States by the Crown of Spain, as part of the closing transaction of the Spanish-American War. The teaching and cartoon began. A class in civilization is taught by Uncle Sam to the new students who, beyond consent, as clearly stated in the illustrations blackboard on the right, are taught in a room including a physical earth globe, colonized subjects, and obedient states. Again, the cartoon materialized. Stories about the new possessions were being implemented in school curricula in the US reproducing colonial histories through the sight and imagination of those in power. The image construction continues, imagining not only a territory, but a subject who is a businessman and prosper or the early stages of the supremacy of financial entrepreneurship. New maps were created to document the sources for extraction, like agricultural plantation maps, or military enclaves and communications infrastructure, among others. But I would like to zoom out now to guide you through a visual timeline of some of the critical moments of the story of texts, images, and maps. First in Paris, France signed the agreement of Puerto Rico's fate in 1898. Then the Fourth Act of 1900 signed at the US Congress in Washington, establishing a civilian government for the island. In 1917, the people of Puerto Rico were assigned US citizenship with restrictions of representation, but not military duties, like serving in war. It was also under the John Schaeffer Act that a triple tax exemption was created at the local, state, and federal level for American business interested in Puerto Rico. 1920 followed with the Merchant Marine Act that conditioned in the context of an island that every ship with goods coming into and out of Puerto Rico must have must happen in a US-made vessel under a US company and all the way through a US port. Uh, 1952 formalized the ambivalence of Puerto Rico's uh, status quo by the hand of the first locally elected governor, Luis Muñoz Marín. Puerto Rico was allowed to craft its own constitution, give it an island and apparent sovereignty of, and autonomy from its ruler. However, <coughs> the clause was entered in the constitution. In the case of government of Puerto Rico do not have enough money to keep itself running, it must pay, first pay its creditors before any public provision. In 1976, an economic incentive was created for developing jobs through another tax reduction program known as the Section 936, opening high-skilled jobs in the island for locally educated people and great benefit for the U.S. companies who decided to set up operations there, particularly the pharmaceutical industry. Later in 1984, a low-key revision to the bankruptcy code redefined the concept of territory making is specific for the 50 states, excluding Puerto Rico. During the 10-year period from 1996 to 2006, the Section 96 program was phased out 
eliminated thousands of jobs in Thailand, and was also a period where they grew significantly. In late 20, 2006, Puerto Rico inaugurated a sales tax to help palliate its deficit, passing the growing burden onto its residents. This tax was defined under COFINA, which is the Spanish acronym for Puerto Rico Urgent Interest Fund Corporation. That eventually added around 22% to the total debt. This sales tax in COFINA was in part designed by a woman's tax representative two years before the 2008 crash. Money was taken to keep the government running, privatization of the infrastructure, massive layoffs happened all during the last three administration. Notwithstanding, the U.S. debt and its ceiling in blue get rising and it is expected to surpass $20 trillion by the end of this year. Puerto Rico eventually ran out of money to keep operating and its constitution for them to pay traders first. There was no money for them either. This takes us to 2014 when the last of those administrations issued $3.5 billion in bonds. Immediately, 275 companies from all over the world responded. These bonds were explicitly noted as high risk, and hedge managers did not wait to react. However, global, the big majority of them were transactions from companies distributed across the US with a big concentration in the East Coast. It is no surprise that the biggest concentration of those were in New York City, with major participants in Lower Manhattan but consolidated mostly in Midtown. Years ago, Saskia Sassen was discussing the liquidity of finance in the context of the newest thin and tall skyscrapers in Midtown Manhattan, and that we needed to ground that money. Puerto Rico's debt might be somehow different, but I have persisted to ground it first in the island's territory before framing it within the context it belongs to under the umbrella of the US financial system. I will, however, ground that money on the island as well as this project continues. But when we look at this map, consider that 44% of Puerto Ricans live under the poverty rate established by the US, and of those, 28% live with under $10,000 a year. Midtown Manhattan's median income is a minimum of $200,000, with a large concentration of much more. A median cost for household condo is $1 million, and with at least an 80% white population. In 2016, the U.S. Congress passed the PROMESA Act, signed by President Obama, the Puerto Rico Oversight, Management, and Economic Stability Act, in which an oversight board takes supreme control over the island provisions. The island's undeniable colonial condition had yet again nearly resurfaced. But this construction happened also in the register of words and images. Words and images that are also hegemonic, infrastructural, mostly as products of the supremacy of finance, they impact governments and individuals alike, including those who are willingly subjected to the colonial mandate and have embodied the proper business map of the 1900 cartoon. <coughs> others have not shown it, and others have responded and resisted from every, every possible front. Yet there are key actors and players who help us understand these asymmetries. As an example, Mark Roski from Aurelius Capital, one of the current hedge fund holders of debt, argues not jokingly that the oversight board imposed on Puerto Rico is unconstitutional and that he prefers to follow the mandate at his benefit of the Puerto Rico constitution. The same figure had benefited in the past from betting against the crash of Argentina. But the debt keeps moving and circulates rearranged within Big Town and Lower Manhattan. This is the late 2017 status of the debt transaction and its locations that will soon be mapped. However, these transactions and these operations, at least these days, are not individual actions. A month ago, the U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin just announced the creation of Opportunity Zones, in which, as it broadly circulates in the Wall Street Journal, the entire territory of Puerto Rico is an Opportunity Zone. There are no formal cartoons included in this news. Perhaps there's no more irony needed. There is, however, a photograph of the instrumentalization of architecture as a product of real estate and many signing documents in Washington. Among the Treasury Secretary past collaborators and a crucial figure of the 2008 housing crisis is the New York City billionaire John Paulson, who also participated in the 2013 Puerto Rico bonds transaction, made billions from the 2008 housing crisis, and have increased his presence in the island acquiring hotels, resorts, and real estate development. Mr. Paulson, one of the field continue working with, 
was an economic advisor for Donald Trump's presidential campaign and worked with now Secretary Mnuchin as hedge fund manager back in 2008. He owns the refurbished and expanded Vanderbilt Hotel in Condado, Puerto Rico, who now appeals to its old glory of 1919, when the hotel opened to European and Hollywood royalty. His San Regis resort, also in Puerto Rico, like a military enclave, happily reproduced and construct narrative in his plantation house, the hallmark of early 1900 colonial extraction and exploitation. For a few, everything is okay, or todo bien, as read the color for painting on the restaurant's wall. Puerto Rico's death, its infrastructure, is not only to be audited from within by local agents scrutinizing every penny to hold their elected officials accountable, but also from without, with text, images, and maps, perhaps starting in Manhattan's big town. Hola, uh, my name is Mark Martin Brass. I come from Vieques, Puerto Rico, and I call it an island uh, in the wind because it's kind of how it felt. Uh, first of all, I don't know where you've been to Vieques or not, but it's a municipality of Puerto Rico, which is a commonwealth, and we're U.S. citizens in a way, and in the sense of the colonial aspects, we would be like a colony of Puerto Rico too, if you consider the way that things went down in Vieques. Uh, we're about uh, 9,000 people. Uh, we're isolated by water, which is something that during this response was looked at as this imaginable, unsurpassable way to treat or fix a place, but then you consider all the other islands that I've done and you consider how far Hawaii is, you know, it doesn't seem that hard. Weirdly, our water and uh, energy it come from the main island, Puerto Rico, underwater to our west coast, until Maria hit, right? We have a very complex history, you probably remember more than anything, the military occupation and the bombing that happened and the civil disobedience that came an international movement on a very small island. Uh, we have gone through a lot of different uh, stages in our history and we were in a real state of tourism boom right before Maria that brought obviously economic development but an immense danger. If you consider we had an island that still held some of the greatest things an island should have, uh, then Maria hit and everything became very different. You can see a development of Vieques, it's 21 miles by four and a half miles because this was military and then monoculture of sugar came before. The development of the towns was in the middle. And they gave some of this land back when the Navy left. We have weird transportation systems that are inconsistent at best. And we have a, a limit, one of the poorest education systems in all of Puerto Rico, which is one of the poorest in all the United States. Uh, we have a very limited amount of services, and when the emergency hit, we were completely unprepared. If we were out there for weeks without having anybody from the central government of Puerto Rico or from FEMA even step foot on the island. And we were in shock. What Monge was saying is we're in therapy because we lived a really hard shock that took a lot of people, including the local government, out. And so you have people, oceanographers, and you have teachers, and you have technical difficulties <laughs> that had to step up and do the job of people that were just simply in their homes, that didn't know exactly what they, they could do. Um, the recovery was very slow at best, and it was an exercise in inefficiency. I cannot tell you how many times we had assessments, people come over in helicopters with teams of 10, 20, to five times for the hospital generator to assess it, and then they got the wrong one. We had a, a structure that was just really hard to organize, and if it wasn't for the private groups, I don't know what would have happened to get weeks without any interaction. Language barriers, the administrative process was a failure, but the ego is something we should not ignore, because it was a huge part of the problem, and still is a huge part of the problem, and it's part of the problem that people that also are trying to bring solutions because they don't understand that they're trying to help people that do have power and knowledge and skills. They're not this bunch of idiots in a corner that can't do anything, therefore they need help. They may not have the resources, but the better aspect would be to empower it. This did not work at all. It was a total chaos at all levels, and still is, and we're still living some of it. Without power today, I woke up, I got in, oh, all power, completely, 100% out in the end. What happened? We don't know. 
So one of the infrastructure problems we had was communication. Uh, we had no power in the island. We had people bringing mini inverters. We had almost mob mentality. We ran out of gas. We ran out of diesel. We ran out of water. We had limited food. We ran out of medicine in the hospital. And then the hospital had to be closed because it was damaged. So we had the undersea cable situation. And that we'll get to back again a little bit. We have Tesla come in. One of the few cases where that corporate infusion came, whether they did it for this reason or that other reason, they did power a lot of the accession things on the island and were offered, actually went to a burger government said, I'm sure with financial interest as well and PR interest, so I will power the whole island, takes eight months. In October, we'll do it, sure. You'll pay me, uh, we'll give you a discount already, we'll look great. I'll be Elon Musk powering Vegas, Vegas Island, Tesla, you know. They said no, and still we're powered by generators which are running at about $22,000 a day, and they just shut up today, right? Completely unsustainable, making people have asthma attacks, etc. And the incompatibility of some of the answers has led to a lot of thinking and a lot of assistance. We are in a situation now, power-wise, where Vieques could become really fantastic in a way, in terms that it could have a hybrid solar system, it could have uh, the smartest grid, because one of the things that I want to instill is that places like this could become a model if it's a model for the people there. And that, we're waiting on all these situations to happen, but as of today, none are signed. The housing, we have 350 houses completely destroyed, and we had a, a confusion about what we could do. We have people with a lot of money saying, I will fix the house, and people are going, no, 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 no. They, they ask for money. It's duality. That's fraud. We'll take them to court. It's like, but they're, they're getting water inside their house. They're getting asthma. They got mold. No, 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 no. You have to wait for the decision. And we had a lot of problems in that. But there's still people living in tents on the beach. Uh, not this one, but another one. Uh, they're still in some of these situations. And the blue tarp program is, is, I don't know how it was in Puerto Rico, completely not a face in Vegas. And I bring to you that part of the answers in solutions after a hurricane is that people have to see it. They ignoring the culture and the ignoring of how the people live in a place and the nature of a place, which is fantastic by the way, is uh, exercise in failure. You know, I can't tell you how many solutions, how much money was spent, how many things were brought without getting local knowledge of people like this. Food-wise, we had incredible <coughs> problems. And all these solutions that came that did not consider the local people, so they didn't work. Money wasted. So it leads us to believe that rather than to come and establish what should happen on these islands and their culture and everything like that, you should empower the people there to be ready. And that's something that really wasn't done. Big fishing community, hey, help them get the things to fish. Big tourism community, help get them out. This also transfers into what happens when you have all these things going on really good, and then you get this. And people don't like to see it anymore because it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, yes, the drama and all this kind of thing. But it's really what people went through. And it's really what they had to deal with afterwards. And in Vieques, we had emergency service, you know, completely limited. This is our roads right in front of the coastline. We were without power uh, for about eight months in a way, <coughs> but we still without power today. And we had people doing the work, basically. The reality of what we saw was that nobody was ready for this. We didn't know about it. And so we had to go and create new systems, create new uh, uh, solutions for it. And I go forward because my time is running out. But what we work with is environmental. And what we're thinking is, you know, what kind of what you have to do is to get people in skill transfer and to train. Uh, Colombia, for example, got involved through the studio. And that's one case where they said, okay, we'll do a Vegas initiative, we'll go there. Did they come and say, hey, we'll plan and we'll give you the answer? No. We talked to the people, we spent the time seeing what everybody needed and tried to develop. And what happens is that we were there in a room. And in the room, the mayor, vice mayor, all these people are there, and we all fighting. There's like a communal anger going on, and suddenly the Columbia students came. 
we're trying to do this thing and we want to know and, and everybody changed and it was a virtuous exchange because it wasn't an overlapping thing trying to go over and tell you what to do it was an interaction that they wanted to know and it helped us look at it in a different way and so we're happy that they, they came down and we're still working on that we are working on different models and I think that's the key of islands like Vieques in Puerto Rico, the complexity of it does not allow for an easy visual model of how we should live in terms of the infrastructure of water, energy, uh, food, uh, safety, and all that. So we're trying to create reliable, rural, resilient centers like this so that people can come and actually transfer that skill from all over the world without trying to overpower the island like in Vieques. Because Vieques right now is in a very precarious situation because of what you all heard of all of these people. Everybody's saying, wait, it's beautiful, you saw it. It's cheap now, we can buy, we can take over, we can have this, this situation. We have zero education, bikes, high school in Vieques. So there's an exodus of people who want to further along. So the skill transfer, I think, is something that has to go around with any infrastructure aspect. And I think it's a model for the world. Uh, same as it's uh, a microcosm of what's happening in Puerto Rico and all that you heard. Uh, it is a microcosm to what's happening to the world in terms of climate change and environmental considerations that have to be done. So what I think we should do is not forget, like what you were saying, when we were having the here again, everybody was in a complete shock. As soon as you plug the electricity back in, there's a certain regressing back to that level. This is a time where we just have to make a stop. In our case, it was Maria, but we plan to amplify that to the world to realize that if you do not go the environmental way, it's just gonna keep on happening all throughout. And there's a series of political, and there's a series of uh, economical drivers that are changing that. But there is a human factor that can help them make a model. We think Piaget is visible enough on a right scope that we can show the world a better way. Thank you. Okay, uh, first I want to thank um, Columbia University for the invitation. You know, it's, a, it's a privilege to be here and it's a privilege to be here. It's a fantastic panel. Um, what I want to do today is, is, is really share a number of questions and observations that, that, uh, that come about as a result of, uh, of the event of the hurricane. Um, obviously, this is it. You know? And there are two slides that I want to show right after because I think that just, just to recapitulate, they are important. And this is uh, Puerto Rico the day before the hurricane. You know? And this is right after. The, the, the magnitude of the implications of an event like this are absolutely extraordinary in terms of how it shapes the lives and the things that you take for granted as part of sort of your everyday uh, uh, routine, your everyday experience. Uh, this is the town of Manapi. And this we've already talked about. The, issue is that there certainly has been uh, an interest and a concentration on the idea of infrastructure as hard infrastructure. And that's obviously very, very important, and particularly when the whole country is without, um, without power. But one of the things that I would like to put forward uh, uh, as part of this presentation is the idea of looking at public space and that component of our physical built environment, the public realm, as a fundamental infrastructure. And it, was, it is one that certainly the government has not paid attention to because they were concentrating on, on issues of, of power and water supply and all this. Now, if we think of public space, not necessarily as the gardens and plazas and, and parks, but really as that public realm that we share as citizens, including streets and sidewalks, and certainly the parks and the, and the common spaces, which are very, very, very important, uh, particularly in our Latin Caribbean culture, it is something that has been dramatically um, changed as a result of the hurricane. 
And what I have begun, began to observe is that as a result of the hurricane, our appropriation of public space started changing. Uh, obviously, we have to manage, you know, in the, the first days after the hurricane, the idea of mobility, the way that we move about the city had to be reassessed and, and uh, you know, there is a, a dramatic, I don't know if he made the stop, you know, and, and, uh, but this is, uh, uh, this is on the way up to Calle, you know, uh, just imagine the idea of a country that loses its trees in one day, this is absolutely extraordinary, you know. So, uh, I want to put forward three sort of ideas to rethink the nature of public space. And it part partially comes from my own experience because I had dedicated a good part of my life as an architect in designing public spaces. No? This is one of uh, uh, my public spaces now in San Juan, uh, El Parque del Indio. No? Very, very nice Caribbean public space, very well used, etc. And, and here we see it with its grove of palms. And, and, and then I got this photograph on my telephone. No? So as an architect, I'm confronted with sort of my own architecture, just putting it sort of personally, and what that architecture represents to the public in having myself to reassess the work that I have done and the way that I have done it, <coughs> and saying, there has to be something different. From now on, we cannot keep on doing things the same way that we have. No? So a little bit to, to, to Moncho's question about, is it worth saving Puerto Rico for Puerto Ricans? The answer is no, if that answer is in the same way that we have always done it. But the answer is yes, if we can start thinking of fundamental paradigm shifts in the way that Puerto Rico's and, and, and we concentrate on the built environment, in the way that Puerto Rico's built environment sort of uh, uh, operates. So with the idea of common ground uh, and, and how do we reassess uh, the notion of public space as part of our ability to build a resilient city or a resilient country, you know? No? I, 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 I've been observing sort of three conditions that sort of interest me. The first was the shift in the way that people use space, public space, as healing space. The second has to do with this construction of sustainable mobility, sort of a larger infrastructure of the way that we move and experience within the city, and, and, and most fundamentally the idea of public space as democratic space. No? And just to go through, through, through these very, very quickly, no, I know that, that, that no? People started looking at public space as a way to share, as a place to share, as a place to get assistance. No, So there is physical healing space, but there is also emotional healing space. It was the, the, the place to go and get information. You know, Have you, have you heard from the, the town of Arcuntas? Uh, 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 how can we get uh, uh, um, um, uh, materials or supplies to this place or this place. Do you know about my family? Have you seen my cousin? And also this idea, uh, this broader idea of public space as healing space <coughs> became very, very important. No? And the comfort that finally, after some days of not having food or not being able to find the food in the supermarkets, I can get it here. No? So that sort of reappropriation of public space as healing space is important. The second is the idea of sustainable beauty. And obviously, there are these fundamental problems about how we move within the city in a moment of environmental crisis. But when I started looking after this and seeing, for example, a place like El Tren Urbano, uh, the urban train in San Juan, the public transport, and if you take the urban train with a fantastic investment in stations and, and sort of the, the capacity of the train to move, if you think about the way that you get from the train station out to the destination, let's say the University of Puerto Rico, etc., you see that the public realm in normal conditions is completely inadequate. It's completely uh, um, uh, unsustainable in terms of facilitating the way that people move within the city. So when it collapses, then it, it, these things sort of come to the surface. So that second component that I think that we have to relook 
is the idea of sustainable mobility in whatever form it takes. And finally, the idea of, of, of public space as democratic space. And democratic space implies that there have to be certain physical qualities embedded in the public realm that ensure accessibility, that ensure inclusiveness, that ensure the possibility that people of different backgrounds and different religions and different sort of uh, uh, economic uh, classes are able to share this without the general uh, uh, stigmas of uh, um, exclusion and, and, of, and of separation and all of these other things. So these are the, 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 the behavior of space uh, uh, and the ability to be together in space is sort of a, a, a lesson in itself. And obviously, there's the reappropriation of creating new public spaces. Uh, and, and how do you, do you uh, uh, assimilate the idea of transforming space as sort of a collective uh, gesture? And these are uh, uh, events that happen in public space. For example, the, the, the Orquesta Sinfonica giving free concerts in public spaces and, 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 and in community centers, etc., as part of that healing process. And finally, just to, to conclude, uh, Hurricane Maria happened two weeks after Harvey, three days after Irma, uh, right after the, 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 the banks of the Seine were flooding, um, the wildfires in California. So this is not uh, alone a Puerto Rican sort of situation. And I think that there are certainly lessons in Puerto Rico that, that have to be looked at uh, in cities worldwide and, and, and look at certainly the capacity of public space to sort of uh, build common ground for all of us. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, I want to thank uh, everyone involved in this invitation. Um, I really, I've been working kind of on something obsessively for a few months, so this is great to come out and talk to other people. Um, I, I want, be, before I start, though, I want to say that uh, um, I decided not to actually talk a lot about the piece that Mocho was mentioning, the Eking I know it's going to come out soon. But I do feel compelled to say three things or three conclusions from that piece that speak to a, a question he posed about, um, about Puerto Rico being saved. And, and the first thing about emptying that I found in my piece is that uh, the, the experience of growth, of population growth, is actually an anomaly in the last 520 years in Puerto Rico. Emptying has been the more dominant logic throughout that period, from the genocide of the indigenous people uh, to mass migrations in the 20th and 21st century. So we put it in that context, then I would suggest that yes, I mean, better, better times might indeed come. The second thing I want to underscore is that Puerto Rico is not an island. <laughs> in at least two fundamental ways. And that's why I also think empty is a, such a dangerous trope. Uh, the first way it's not an island is that Puerto Rico is, is part of an archipelago. Vieques, Culebra, Mona, Monito, a chip, right? But at another level, Puerto Rico is not an island because it has relationships with multiple other locations, forming what we could call an archipelagic configuration. So if we think about it in that term, when people leave Puerto Rico, they're not entirely leaving Puerto Rico, or, or they're leaving Vieques, or Culebra. If there are relationships that are pretty thickly constituted, and I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and the third thing that I will dwell on a bit more is that the same emptying infrastructure has been repurposed for other things. So it's the, the in infrastructure and the emptying process uh, is not uh, a linear process, but it gets disrupted uh, from the infrastructure itself outward. So having said that, I will leave. Um, so the first thing I should say is I'm new to this conversation of infrastructure. Um, as so many scholars of Puerto Rican Latinx studies granted in humanities, 
uh, we have paid some attention, I feel, to technology, uh, particularly in relation to music and media studies, but not so much to the concept of infrastructure. Uh, not only did it sound incredibly dry, you know, uh, in some way, but uh, I, I think to some extent um, it, it, it risked returning us to certain strands of structuralism, you know, including Marxist structuralism, which so many of us have struggled for decades to move from. Uh, the infra now located somehow under political, economic structure and cultural superstructure. Uh, which is not problematic that I'm going to get in right now, but I think it's something worth thinking about a little more. Um, now, of course, in the aftermath of Maria, um, dr drastically changed all of us in all our fields. Uh, regardless, so it's not only urban planners or architecture uh, or others in, in related fields. I've been thinking about this for, for some time, but I think everybody uh, this was because, um, you know, not only there was, you know, post on the floor, but there were more than 3,000 deaths as a result of declining infrastructure. Um, and this made infrastructure not only a new concept, but also a new trope. And I think this is a, a bit of another conceptual danger that I'm working through, which is has become a, a, a trope to narrate everything. You know, a, a master trope, uh, colonialism, capitalism, political economy, economy cultural, etc. But as I began working my way through the concept, uh, I saw that rather than the blackout begin this awareness, I feel instead came at the right time to see it as such. And that's because when things fall apart, as Shinoa Achebe once put it, infrastructure becomes particularly exposed. And there's no doubt that things are falling apart and being reconfigured, sometimes still with the wires hanging everywhere, and that's not only in Puerto Rico. Um, and when I start reading across disciplines, I, I actually have to conclude that there is, in fact, an infrastructure term, not only in fields usually in, um, interested in studying infrastructure, but beyond them. And I'll give you two recent examples that I'm trying to work through in the work that I'm doing now. One is from the work of Yannick Team, who is developing the concept of infrastructure in the context of the theory of affect. <laughs> so in texts like The Politics of Affect, Team argues that as theories based on reason and rationality are increasingly inadequate to explain a wide range of phenomena, including consumer, cultural production, and political behavior, a notion of effective infrastructure is necessary. I just put a picture like this. And I think you can see a point to that. Um, this concept would allow us to inquire into how we make sense of the world through various forms of emotional attachments uh, rather than the prior uh, concept based on reason and rationality. And also I explain how seemingly contradictory <coughs> political vocabularies can be binding for the same groups, which is something that's been going on in our national politics for, for a few years now. A second example that's a bit closer to our topic comes from political scientist Edgardo Melendez's recent book, Sponsor Migrations. Uh, the State of, uh, of Puerto Rican Postal Migration to the United States, where he dedicates a substantial chapter to air transportation <coughs> titled, There Ain't No Buses from San Juan to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. And he draws on the importance of this infrastructure to organize what he calls government-sponsored migration. Interestingly, Melendez argues that it's not only infrastructure, but it had to be a certain kind of in infrastructure. For instance, it had to be commercial and it had to be safe. Uh, a process that only changed the scale of migration, but also the ways that Puerto Ricans could connect to the U.S. and the diaspora, as well as the development of industries like tourism. I mean, a big point that he makes in this chapter is that unlike most people think, air transportation did not account uh, uh, to uh, stimulate tourism but actually tourism came after uh, uh, infrastructure had to be provided to move migrants from Puerto Rico to the United States. Ultimately, to manage this migration and this movement, the government also approved a number of uh, legislation that in turn uh, created various forms of institutional or bureaucratic infrastructure to make this happen. Now, in my current work, the reason I became interested is in infrastructure um, in migration studies uh, is that I was wondering, uh, I, I actually had to answer the question of the speed of MT uh, after Hurricane Marie. How can we account for the fact that in a very short period of time, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people actually were able to leave? 
So that it started uh, uh, making me think about elements that are not normally thought about as infrastructure as infrastructure. For instance, US citizenship as a form of infrastructure because it does not provide very many rights uh, if you live in Puerto Rico, but it does allow for free movement from the island to the United States. Uh, so perhaps we also have to think about some aspect of, of legal system as forms of infrastructure. Uh, of course, uh, actual commercial infra, uh, uh, air transportation, as Melinda suggested. But also, and this is the other part, because I was uh, uh, um, concerned with the question of how could the federal government get away with this, of not investing in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. And I realized that another, uh, perhaps overlooked element of infrastructure were the Puerto Ricans that were already in the United States. Their physical resources and the emotional resources. If it had not been that these 5.5 million people existed in the United States, I wonder if and how this emptying could have happened. So in that regard, uh, these various elements of infrastructure were completely necessary to actually uh, propel emptying as uh, a way to uh, the federal government uh, not support. Uh, Puerto Ricans on the island after Hurricane Maria and not relieve them during the entire debt crisis period. At the same time, I was interested in how do we use that same infrastructure, or how that, that same infrastructure was used by the diaspora, repurposing it to other ends. And uh, it is clear that if you may, uh, you can make a very, very long list that indeed uh, Puerto Ricans from the United States uh, mobilized those same resources in order to assist Puerto Ricans sometimes three weeks, many more weeks, months before the federal government actually got to Puerto Rico. And to make a very long list, uh, for instance, uh, Puerto Ricans arrived with blue tarps uh, ahead of FEMA, Puerto Ricans uh, arrived with medicine and medical care ahead of the federal government, and you also have to raise the question of how is that possible, but um, that's another conversation. Um, the second, uh, you know, working through the Empty Island, um, you know, these were some of the questions that I became engaged that involved the question of the rethinking of infrastructure. And then the second uh, work that I'm, that I'm doing has to do with art in particular. Uh, after uh, curating an exhibit called uh, Puerto Ricans Underwater, I uh, became interested in art infrastructure for two reasons. The first reason is that I noticed that the very art that I was uh, including in the show actually was about infrastructure in some ways. Money, finance, physical infrastructure. This is Santurce, uh, the work of Huascar Robles. Uh, Salvador Santos's work, which is a chronicle of uh, the debt crisis and hurricane, uh, post-hurricane crisis. Uh, as uh, engaged by uh, photographing debris. Uh, all these works I also found, uh, when the question of archive was mentioned, that art was also playing a big role in archiving the crisis uh, in various ways. Uh, the larger inspiration for me to become interested in art as infrastructure, however, came from uh, an analysis of the short story by Jose Luis Gonzalez La and I won't, uh, I, I won't uh, go into all the details, but I would say that one of the things that uh, he concludes in this, in this uh, short story is that illumination comes from darkness, or from the blackout, which I think is something that artists have very much taken to heart, and I see that I'm done. So I will just show you uh, a few uh, ways that I think art is uh, becoming infrastructure or reflecting on infrastructure. The first is that our infrastructure was at least in jeopardy in Puerto Rico. This is Celia Sanchez studio after the hurricane. Uh, the second way is the ways that um, art uh, and infrastructure projects are coming together. This is the Cine Solar Initiative or Casa Pueblo. So bringing new technologies of solar energy and combining them with uh, showing of artistic work. And there's also itinerant movie house that moves around. Um, three is the ways that art is repurposing and taking crumbling infrastructure. Uh, you can see that in the explosion of murals and public art, uh, and the ways that this very process is also a strategy of placemaking in the face of uh, neoliberal uh, empty of housing. There's a lot of those. 
And then there's the ways that our collectives are also uh, producing uh, models of autogestion or self-governance uh, under margins of the state. And it's the ways that was mentioned by uh, the earlier presenter about uh, the ways that public space has become healing space. This is a, a, a reflection on the death uh, of, of Maria, the debate around how many and the recognition of, of that pain. Uh, but one of the things that's interesting here is how art is becoming uh, also um, an, an infrastructure for monumentalizing or memorializing things that are uh, uh, events and processes that are being obscured by the state. So lastly, I guess my conclusion would be that when things fall apart, the imagination needs to take over. There's a lot of infrastructure work to do. Barra. Hi. Um, first of all, I want to say that I'm really grateful to have an audience to show my work to. I'm grateful to the colleagues that preceded me. They have prepared the soil for us. I have to say. And I'm also grateful to those who invited me to come to this house. It was here where I decided to focus my PhD in Puerto Rico because it was for me at the same time an exemplary case in the, an experimental laboratory of US policies that we're going to be seeing later on in the south of the United States but also in the what's called now the global south. So I'm very grateful for all of you to be here and to be here. And the second thing I want to say is that I'm going to apologize because there's no way that I can fit 10 minutes what was the work of many years. So I think I have a small strategy to make the time fit and I will let you know a little bit about it. But I, have, I want to start with this image which was taken 20, 90, 90 years ago and when I found it in the archives in the University of Puerto Rico I was fascinated because probably nobody in that picture is alive and I wish we could speak to them or they could speak to us of what went wrong then and what's going wrong now and why haven't we learned enough lessons to avoid it to happen again. Because in this case you see a formal house completely destroyed. This is not the case of a precarious settlement. And it is raised to the ground and it is what we were going to be witnessing again and again and again in Puerto Rico with the different hurricanes. So that's why I chose this to begin with. And this was my little intro. I'm going to uh, speak about intro. I'm going to just focus on the case studies. I'm afraid I won't be able to get to the ta second table, which is the relief and policy trends. And I'll jump into the conclusions. But the image that I'm showing to the left, it's also a very telling image of the 50s in Puerto Rico, a time in which the island government was trying to put forward a proposal of how to understand hurricanes and make it a collective project top down from the state. So this is the poster of a film, which is called Oregon, and it's it's still bearing some of the ideas that, you know, there's a, a this, is, this was a rural country that you had to migrate, and there's something human about the hurricane blowing people's lives, which is what I put read in this poster. And it's also related to the way disasters are built in a way by how we humans use space and how we allocate knowledge, resources, infrastructure. So this is my little trick to beat myself with time. This is the end of it. I mean, these are my conclusions. So if I don't get to your conclusions, <laughs> I'm grateful if you put attention to this. I think that after studying these three hurricanes, I have three lessons that I want to share with you. One is that we would need critical and multidisciplinary knowledge, long term, with different systems of knowledge to inform action. Because that's why at the end of the term, at the end of the story, I think planning is about action. So how do we decide to act? I propose that we do the, we try to be critical. We try to challenge assumptions and so on. My second lesson would be that we have to focus on what one the pre wrong, the pre-existing factors that enable a storm not to be a storm anymore, but to become a disaster. So there's a big difference between what can happen with the same hurricane, earthquake, snowstorm, depending on the place, depending on how information is there, knowledge, what kind of societal grounds are there for people to react to a disaster. 
And then the last lesson I learned, I think that disaster management in the case of Puerto Rico and many others, it needs to go beyond the relief decisions that have shaped the island responses throughout the three cases I managed to study, which meant a change of the island, a very significant change from the island being a Spanish colony to being part of an unincorporated territory of the US to becoming a commonwealth of the US. So my three case studies are a few months after the after US took over from Spain. And you can see, if you go back to my colleague Andres, how street and infrastructure and mobility need to be rethought. In that later image, you see a man riding a horse and the water is up to the chest. And this was, eight, um, let me see, 1899. So it's, if you just change the vehicles, that's what we saw in the other pictures. We see this recurring crisis of infrastructure, of road and mobility. And uh, the second one is a, a 1928, a few months before the crash of the stock exchange, which was going to ripple over Puerto Rico massively. And uh, it shows a hurricane, San Felipe, that was the source for Nora Sealhurst to write their eyes with Ochi God. And it's a massive regional problem that was never seen as a regional problem. It was studied in an isolated fashion, and it was also dealt with in an isolated fashion. As if the same hurricane <coughs> blowing all across, it's, this fra it's fragmented, and there's this lack of understanding of the region as a cohesive unit, you know, withstanding the history of colonialism. And the third picture shows uh, 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 um, the aftermath of Hurricane Santa Clara in 56, four years after the Commonwealth, that being the island government, was set up, in which the major, uh, you can see still this very rural background of poverty that my colleagues were explaining before, the own bond dependency debate. So with this image, I just want to speak about the asymmetrical relationship of Puerto Rico. And this is a very brave cartoonist in 1915, speaking of Puerto Rico as a small barefoot vendor who was completely dependent on what the US wanted to sell him. Food, uh, uh, arms, tools, and so on. So this is another factor of continuity <laughs> that is going to show up, and it has shown up during Hurricane Maria. This is more of the same. I'm going to skip them. So I'm going to focus now on what I thought were like um, uh, withstanding patterns of transformation, and in this case, how the growth engines during the first two hurricanes were to depend massively on one export crop, sugar, which meant the complete change of the coastal landscape, complete uh, transformation of areas that were buffers to hurricanes and floods, for example, marshes, uh, ponds, rivers, mangroves, and so on, for the quest of, of sugar. And once during Hurricane Santa Clara, the third one by the 40s, when this export was decaying, uh, it, uh, the economy changed towards a targeted industrialization, institutional reform, and migration, as we saw in the picture of the plains, later on tourism and construction. So at the end, what I could distill from all this time is that for the most part, the economic growth engines were always pushing for vast gains for corporations and at best, mixed results for lay citizens. And in the second one, you can see the pattern of urbanization all along the coast. This is the path of the strongest hurricanes of the 19th century. And uh, I, someone is disproportionately shown here. It's, it should be a huge dot in comparison to the other. But what this map is saying is that even at, during the night, Already by the 19th century, the fate of vulnerability to floods, for example, to coastal floods and to winds and so on, was established. Because most of the cities are along the coast. And this makes the whole, the whole urban infrastructure mostly subject to surges, also tsunamis, and so on. And uh, planning and investment. What I studied was that during the, when I started my the time period that I started to study until the end, the planning and investment levels were increasing, but for the most part, they were targeting commodities and oftentimes keep US interest 
very questionable one sometimes, by force if needed, with gradual inclusion of lay citizens. So, for example, the railroad was established not to move people across the island, but to export goods out of the island. And as soon as that model was not effective, it was abandoned, the railroad system. And this is another way in which you can see how infrastructure was, it existed, because it did, but it was not meant to be used for the development of citizens in the same way that it meant to be used for crops and exports and goods and so on. So this is another example of the same debate. These pictures, they are taken one year apart. On the left-hand side, you see the refinery model to be built in southern Puerto Rico and the tax, uh, the tax exemptions that we just heard of. Huge environmental degradation and uh, the vast gains that the government, the US government and the Puerto Rican government were offering these firms, it's, it's, if, if you look at it, it's one of these um, mechanisms of entrenching power. Because at the same time that this was happening, on the left hand side, you see the dock workers on a strike protesting because their basic needs were not met. Their salary was not even reaching the basic level. So who was this infrastructure being built for and what for is the question that these two images speak of. So there was a great group of investment, but for the left hand side, not for the right hand side, or for the Vieques case that we just saw with my colleague. This is another example of infrastructure throughout the three time periods that I started to study. Uh, at the beginning, it was a very limited uh, investment, mostly export investment, uh, export infrastructure. Infrastructure good for exportation, that's what I'm trying to say, such as ports, bridges, lighthouses, roads, and a fractional railroad. This increased, but by the 1950s, what we had was again a huge investment like this motorway, which helped the gains of private owners and developers. It also privileged individual car transportation over mass transportation, time is up, and <laughs> suburban sprawl and compact growth. Let me see water infrastructure, massive transformation of the island which would put people at risk with the dams. If you've heard 70,000 people were relocated due to an emergency last year with the fear that the dam would break. So in a way it's like the seed of its own destruction, creating uh, a better infrastructure, but with aims of transforming it, of dominating nature, of taming it, which bounces back. So this whole idea of trans uh, transforming the coastline, also uh, precarious housing towards former housing, which later on becomes, as I said, extremely vulnerable to floods, it's part of a loop that needs to be critically assessed, because it's not lack of investment. It's what the assumptions behind where? Where did it go? Who gained from it? And who didn't gain from it? So I would say those are the basic questions that I want to leave you with. I'm very sorry that I couldn't end to the, I couldn't get to the end of it, but another time. Thank you. So, so let's open it up for questions. Uh, my my concern is that. Uh, we are speaking, we all kind of, we'll identify the problem, but I, I don't have a clear picture in my head as to where do we go from here, what has to be done. Uh, some of the things that I, I hear is that there's all kinds of negotiations going on in Puerto Rico, because the finances have to be rearranged, and that's part of the problem. And as long as this question remains, we could have the most brilliant people in the world, uh, Earth planning for Puerto Rico and all that, but these questions have to be resolved uh, in order for us to go forward. Uh, that's my, my comment, and I was wondering if you could help me with that. Uh, okay, well, the short answer to your question is what, what should we do? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Um, and the work that I, I've done a bit of work uh, documenting and uh, starting to do the work of documenting and understanding uh, the ways that the vacuum of government 
uh, created an environment where uh, Autoncion and uh, self-governance um, organizations have flourished. So one of the things that I find uh, interesting and, and, and important uh, to understand is how these initiatives have, are proposing new ways of thinking the very questions of how we go forward or how we resolve things, which is a very different vocabulary and a different scale and raises other questions to what, let's say, the governing elites of Puerto Rico and the United States might do or not do. Uh, so in that regard, I, I would say that anybody that actually wants to become involved in addressing any number of issues that are you know, the totality of things uh, can find a way into that because it is uh, you know, involving every aspect of life from the most fundamental, housing, education, food, energy, etc. Right? Now, if you're talking about the larger dynamics at play, I think those are a lot more complicated and potentially a lot more frustrating which raises to me a question that I haven't resolved yet, that I'm working on, which is what is the relationship between these initiatives of self-governance that uh, define so many different ways and the mainstream political structures? That is one of the, uh, I think, elusive questions for me that I don't know if anyone else here wants to comment on that, but I, I certainly would like to hear what you have to say about that because I think it's one of the most vexing questions related to your question. Yeah, I'll comment on that. Uh, Cantinflas <laughs> used to say, I stand the time. <laughs> um, I think that, that, that and, and sort of uh, pinning on, on your question and also on, on, on part of your answer, is that certainly in Puerto Rico, we have seen sort of two systems of governance, let's say, sort of emerge. There is the official governance, usually top-down, sort of structured by, by, by the government, etc. And then there is the flourishing of bottoms-up um, initiatives of autogestion of self-governance um, uh, occurring simultaneously and sort of riffing a little bit on, on, on Moncho's initial statement one thing that has happened is that we have all at one point or another deemed the government and that top-down structure sort of incompetent and unable to sort of really manage and certainly that was my thought initially as to how things were operating. But sadly, I think that there is a larger menace going on. And it is that what apparently seems like an incompetence, in fact, is a very Machiavellian plan of invisibility in terms of decision making, the inability to have any sort of sense of transparency of the decisions that are being made on behalf of Puerto Rico. Uh, and lack of transparency as to any sort of clear um, policy or, 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 or political drive with, with politics and, and, and on behalf of the people, with, with the big, big people. No. Uh, so in fact, what, what is happening is that there is a very, very, very fast-moving wholesale uh, 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 distribution of Puerto Rico uh, in sort of a, 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 a complicit sort of structure between the government of Puerto Rico and, 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 and investors in the United States. Now, what happens with that alternative strategy with the myriad of uh, initiatives of autogestion is that they are lacking a unified sort of policy that is able to structure them as part of a um, sort of a, a, a larger vision of a future for Puerto Rico. And I think that that idea of 
of how do we, how are we able to articulate a vision as to that transformation that, that you were calling on about when Puerto Rico is so obviously certainly worth saving and Puerto Ricans are worth saving in Puerto Rico. What form does it take uh, takes as an alternate paradigm to the one that we've been living? And, and certainly all of the bottoms up initiatives are very important, but they are operating in the absence of that sort of larger. We sort of feel it and sort of have a, a, a certain understanding and a certain set of values and reasons, but it, 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 it should be. But there is still not an articulated vision where we can say, we are building this piece of sort of this larger puzzle in terms of the face of the future. And I think that that's something that's certainly desperately needed uh, uh, today. Uh, and I think that, in answer to your question, and I think part of their answer is this, uh, to put it simply, you have to change policy. You know, this, this doesn't work. You have to eliminate the Jones Act tomorrow. You know, like there, there, there's something that have no real reason to exist. And whether this is a political climate or not to do it, and I have my opinions, that you have to change that. You're going to find out that you're going to be walking into the same things no matter. There's loopholes of ways to get out. You have to consider changing the Stafford Act, even if you have to fund the agency better. You have to consider allowing a channel for all these private people from the diaspora and from all other ways that have the, the, the right agenda to be a part of this recovery process of urine and of the debt and not choose the existing policy which is like, well, you know what, what we have at our disposal is just selling the entire program, which is going to leave you in the same place. And that's what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. Let's sell everything we got, like it was a bankruptcy. When there's really people that would help. The same way that my colleague over here explained the the economical monster that put Puerto Rico or helped put Puerto Rico by doing it legally into this crisis, there are a lot of people that would help, but there are other channels. And in the sense of the hurricane, we saw, you know, my organization raised a million dollars in less than a month. And we couldn't get into help. We have to go around. It is, I won't be foolish and tell you that there's people bringing $72 billion to pay the debt just to help Puerto Rico like they wanted to help with Maria. But there are ways and policies that can definitely go to that. And the, the one that we have to just kind of get into the brain of people is that no matter how economics drive it and politics drive it, it's environmental. The food, the hurricanes, the life situation, it's all environmental. I'm not saying that because there are miracles only, but you have to quantify how much damage or how much we're putting people in peril by being non-environmental in our planning and our strategies, and we have to change policy there. I know it's a frustrating effort because we're maybe not in the right climate for those particular changes, but you can't ignore that. So it just has to be. I think that they, it was it was mentioned a couple of times uh, it, that there is a strong asymmetry between the relations of the U.S. and Puerto Rico, and I think that in in changing those uh, relations, uh, which are understood as also mentioned here a couple of times, the idea of a pre-existing condition, yes. which I think is a known trope, right? We've heard of that before in here. Uh, the idea that it's a pre-existing that doesn't apply, right? because it's far back, and the reason that I started in, in at least in 1998, precisely is to say there's a pre-existing condition that is still operating. So it's not something that we can sort of easily override, and I think it has to do with a question of history and education of, of that body, uh, precisely the part taught to sort of mostly subject itself to uh, the colonial mandate. So I think it's, in a way, I think to break the asymmetry it has to do with rebuild, if there ever was, a stronger uh, body politic that will take up on the challenges more concrete and real, uh, which are, are infrastructural, right? And the sort of legal frameworks that are very the island. And I think that is, uh, for me, sort of the, the sort of critical turning point for how that can emerge into different models that will take over, coming from self-governance or bottom up and so on, until uh, perhaps the larger superstructure acknowledges and then changes. I wanted to add that um, there's going to be like a hundred million billion dollars coming to Puerto Rico, right? Um, but there's like a, a report actually that um, is recent from the Center for New Economy that shows that 90% of all the contracts have actually gone to firms in the United States. 
So I think that we need aspirants to be able to get um, some of those um, federal funds. And uh, the conversation right now is that there's not um, enough uh, CDCs in Puerto Rico. There might be not enough um, CDFIs that can apply to the scale that might be needed. So there's a lot of like organizations that are like small organizations that have not um, ap applied perhaps for uh, CDBG funds that need, that need to learn about matching funds and so on. So I think that capacity building is like a, a big, big uh, thing. So, and uh, also like how we can get more, more non-profits and people putting proposals together. And I think that the planners have a huge role uh, there in, in community planning. So I think that that's like definitely a, a solution. And um, I think that it was Andres that mentioned that uh, with the, the, the autogestion uh, groups, so the idea of maybe creating a cooperative. So this has some of the conversations that are going now because Puerto Rico has um, a lot of cooperatives. Their system is huge. So what about creating like a cooperative um, of all these like smaller groups that they can access the funds? So there's a lot of work organizing um, happening, and there's also a lot of conversation about intermediaries, how um, organizations here in the United States like LIS, like RASA, like Enterprise, um, can actually like help to be able to put um, like this uh, bigger in scale um, grants that it will be inclusive of these like smaller groups, maybe can get micro grants and so on. So some those are some of the conversations that are happening um, right now. So how we get the funding and capacity building. Um, I think that uh, to answer the, your question straightforward, I think that what we need to do, we have already done it before. And uh, I think that in Puerto Rico and all over the Caribbean, uh, except maybe in Vieques, you know, like because they're a colony of Puerto Rico. Uh, like we, we believe that the ocean ends at the beach. Okay, that's the end of the ocean. We are we we see uh, the ocean as disconnecting us from other places. Uh, and I think that has to change. And I, and I say that we've done this before because since the arrival of Europeans in the Caribbean, one of the ways, uh, and, and obviously before that, that was the case, one of the ways that we were able uh, and, 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 and people were able to survive was through smuggling and through communication with other islands in the Caribbean. Okay, and so uh, when Francis spoke about emotional infrastructure, uh, that 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 really like uh, you know enlightened my, my day because what we've seen here is how infrastructure that are supposed to be dynamics in different realms of life that bring people together, that facilitate life, that enhance production, and so on and so forth. What happens when infrastructure becomes an obstacle? What happens when infrastructure, instead of promoting a sense of belonging, uh, promotes a sense of solitude? And so one of the things when Francis spoke about, about uh, emotional infrastructure uh, is this idea, for example, that the diaspora uh, was able, because of its emotional uh, connection and the existing infrastructure that she referred to, like the, 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 the airplanes and whatnot, like how we were able to, to connect and to small help uh, in Puerto Rico before the federal government. And so we need to connect with the Caribbean. We need to look beyond our shores uh, in ways that, you know what? other people do, like people smuggle drugs and the drugs business is super successful in Puerto Rico because they ignore all that infrastructure that promotes solitude. I'm not promoting like, you know, whatever, but uh, it is something that is done right now. And if drug conglomerates uh, and cartels are able to do it, I think that if we put our political will into it, it's something that can be done. Uh, there are forces against it, like we have 500 years of, of uh, a system systematic effort yeah. to separate the islands of the Caribbean, but we've always survived in part thanks to the uh, 
infrastructural disobedience uh, of our people. I think that we, we need to accept who we are. You know, we are, uh, in a way, uh, uh, smugglers and, and, and people that refuse uh, to, to, to be in, in, in long distance relationships, you know? Like, like, like Puerto Rico, amor de la amor, you know what? Uh, so, uh, so Puerto Ricans and, and all people in the Caribbean, like we refuse to have those emotional relationships uh, be uh, exclusively long distance. So we need to connect in more concrete ways with the other people around us. I feel that the diasporas here, uh, the, the big urban centers in, in the United States play a fundamental role because it's easier for me to connect uh, with someone uh, from Barbuda, from from uh, the Virgin Islands, from from uh, Trinidad and Tobago here in Brooklyn or or in, in, in the Bronx, uh, than in Puerto Rico. And so I think that uh, part of the solution and part of the smuggling uh, uh, goes through through our uh, through our neighborhoods and our uh, organizing efforts here in in, in the United States. You well, actually, it has to do with that. It's pretty, like you mentioned the word refusal, so I just want to say that my argument in the Empty Island is that there's three modalities of refusal that are playing out. One is yo no me quito, I'm not going anywhere. The second one is yo si me quito, but yo no me olvido. Uh, so I think practices of memory, I think, are very important in sustaining any kind of future that Puerto Rico has, not as an isolated island, but an interconnected island, not only to the Caribbean, but also to major locations in the United States and elsewhere. The Puerto Ricans also outside of the United States I have also mobilized and support in support. Um, so, but I have to say that there's another big problem. We don't have to go into it now, but there's another issue which has to do with the crisis of, of, of uh, meta narratives of coming together, which is that a lot of our categories of coming together are in crisis. Uh, and that's, I think, one part of it. And the other part of it has to do with what you were mentioning about capacity building and draining. We, in our working group on payable debt, we've done some, with Moncho and Libertad, we've done some listening tours with activists. And one of the things, number one things that they told us that we're exhausted. We cannot organize in our community and organize the nation and organize in, in a broader or a greater scale. Uh, so, Although this is a monster problem, it has, but it has many heads, power is not concentrated in one place, so that's why I really want to underscore that anybody that wants to work on this can find a way to work on this. There's multiple, <coughs> multiple ways, from small scale, medium scale, larger scale, uh, from the arts to building bridges. There is a very broad gamut, so there's, uh, we shouldn't be overwhelmed by the complexity or the asymmetries and, and so forth but rather look at it that this is a complex problem with multiple points of entry that any, everyone can participate. It's great that you said that because I was going to say the cards are stuck against in this game, the federal government at this moment and the island government are not going to be the ones pushing forward the progressive agenda by bits and pieces that we spoke about here. So at the moment, one of the things I see clearly is the need to build even more resistance at whatever scale one can find there or one cannot find. But adding to what my colleagues have said, I would play, I would put a great emphasis on building and the diffusion of knowledge. And that's one of the things my research pointed me to because there's so, there's so much knowledge being built on the, on the entire Caribbean region, which is experiencing similar processes, different, similar, dissimilar, but if we go beyond this narrative of that colonialism left us, you know, Anglo-speaking countries, Dutch-speaking, English-speaking, and so on, we can find a, a lot of information and uh, ways of dealing with problems at different scales that would be extremely useful. So, when I was doing my archival research, it was completely hard for me to find all the information in one place. And here it is our recurrent drama in the Caribbean, one of the recurrent dramas. So I would also focus on storing the knowledge, making it knowledge uh, known to others through different means, printed means, the internet and whatever. And it would be one of the things I would push forward, knowing history more, and be it small scale oral history, or be it the meta-narratives of history that we need to contest or endorse.
but this would be also for me a cultural project behind that needs to be started on different scales and there is such an amount of knowledge and know-how that I'm very optimistic that there is a lot to be gained from there it's just that we need to also focus no matter what the federal administration is doing or what the island government is doing as practitioners, as scholars, our students, as whatever, our quest for knowledge, for sharing it, for challenging it, is central for building a different Puerto Rico one step at a time. I have no illusions on this being a huge transformation I would love to see. But I do have trust in that by looking at this knowledge, by debating it, by sharing it, we have the possibility of seeing all the spaces of hope which are vulnerable, you know, and they're always going to be perfectible. We can always criticize them, but, but I would bring knowledge and culture and history as one of our big allies. It, it is a, a cultural battle also. It's a political battle, an economic battle, an environmental battle, but it's also dealing with history and culture. And there's a lot there to fight for. And it just needs us to, and others to be aware and know it. Next bit. I'll take a couple yeah, of yeah, yeah. I'm very glad that you're, um, that you're saying that because as some um, of you have been preparing our, our seminar, I've been trying to find you know, just the ordinary maps, and we make maps all the time, so just to find the ordinary maps that describe what happened in Puerto Rico, and they're really, really hard to find. So just for example, when Katrina hit, we knew the levee failed, the lower ninth ward you know, was the most damaged, and then five other neighborhoods were more damaged. We knew which populations were most affected. So I'm just curious, is there a narrative like that that you think is useful about Puerto Rico? Was there one population uh, that was most affected? Was there one city that was most affected? Was it part in the north because of the direction? I'm, I'm just curious, because even, even today, and your talks were all really fantastic, and I really, I learned, I really learned a lot about, you know, sort of what, um, uh, what have <coughs> done. But I'm just curious if there's some major narratives that you think would be useful in, um, yeah, in starting, in starting that debate and comparing uh, Puerto Rico to Houston, to New Orleans, um, et cetera. Because I don't think that's been I don't think that's been done, especially well, in terms of recovery. Just, yeah. just some thoughts yeah, there. If I didn't use my 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 uh, description as an architect, I would call myself a map maker. Mm -hmm. But I was too busy uh, filling diesel tanks yeah. to make any maps. Right. <laughs> I think that yeah. one of the things that that that, that, that and Puerto Rico is still in crisis, you know, it's, it, it's been uh, about a year and, and, and some months, but I would say that we are still sort of in a crisis mode to, to, to a great extent. Uh, but it is important to be able to start um, 2019 sort of being able to put down some um, documentation, some reflections on the documentation. Uh, there is certainly something that is important to look at cross-crisis, like and, 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 uh, and Harvey and, 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 and all that. But I think that, that probably for us, it is more important to look at Puerto Rico against Puerto Rico. So there is sort of a mapping back, a layering of uh, the, those inherent, uh, they use a good term, the, the pre-existing conditions, and, uh, and, 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 and sort of where, where it was. And there is certainly to look at the effect of, Ma, of Maria and, and, and sort of what happened to that. But I think that the other one, is establishing parameters and standards as to what it should be. And, and maybe there is sort of a weird thing about doing that, about projective mapping. You know? The idea of if 
we had, for example, using some of the terms that I brought in my own, if we had a condition of sustainable mobility, what that, would that map look like? And be able to, to sort of um, have a, a shifting vision of a place as it was, and certainly looking at history and mapping throughout history. Uh, uh, and what happened to right before Maria and what was the situation there? What was the result of Maria, but then projecting it towards the future? Maybe that's part of the link as to how we are able to start uh, formulating a, a, a vision about that future that is, that is needed. Just one, one last comment. I think that with Maria, we had a certain complacency, if that's a word, that we had gone through hurricanes before. Yeah. And then there was Hugo, and, and, and there was George's, and all of this. And all of us thought that somehow or another, mm -hmm. we were going to be able to manage it. Yes. Since this is being recorded, I don't want to use the term that I came right into my mind. But no way. This was something that was completely off the charts. And uh, uh, the morning after, we could not even imagine any sort of sense of, of planning that we could have done for something of that magnitude. So uh, uh, yes, we had some training and we knew how, how we did it in, in Yuga and what, it, and what it meant to be one month without electricity at that time or without water, but certainly not, nothing of the order of magnitude of what happened here. So this is, to a certain extent, sort of new knowledge that we have to be able to construct through, through this experience. Also, I, I, think, uh, I just wanted to say that I, I actually find comparisons within and across useful, but Puerto Rico is not a city, although it's a small place, relatively speaking. Uh, it's not a city, and it also is, although small, very diverse uh, physically. So you have mountains, and you have coasts, and you have islands that are not, you know, other islands in the archipelago. Therefore, it would be difficult, uh, I mean, impossible, because it's, it's done by the by journalists, you know, or being done extensively by journalists, like treating Puerto Rico almost like it was just a city, when in fact it's, it's yeah, just one unit, when in fact it's, you know, an archipelago with, you know, seven, eight municipalities. Uh, the condition of the ruralia is completely different right. from the metropolitan. So you have rural and urban, you also have coastal and mountain, you have, uh, you know, island and other islands. Therefore, uh, producing that type of narrative might be much harder, um, although, you know, can be done for certain strategic purposes. Um, or so it needs to take that diversity into account. But in, in more nuanced work, it would have to do that. It would have to take that the fact that it's not a single city, that although a relatively small place, it is extremely diverse demographically and economically and uh, racially and so forth. And I think she's just giving you a, a, a little, if you're, you're going to try to do this, I heard. Yeah, I think you should. And I think, and I, well, I think what, what they're telling you is a big key. It's very different. However, one thing that happened, two things here. One, one thing that happened was we weren't prepared. But let me tell you, we're not prepared now. When, you, when, when the tropical storm Burrow came by and it was trending, became a hurricane, it was coming, I tell you, I, we were setting up a makeshift shelter. This is eight months after Maria, you know, like, nobody is ready, really. And we have FEMA in there. And part of the reason is we're ignoring... Well, rich people, poor people. Yeah, and I, well, I mean, I think rich people are, are, are a lot more ready because they have a lot more resources. But I think in the mapping exercise that you want to do, one thing that was ignored was that because we were struck with that complacency of people were going to save us and, and we have all these life, one thing that changed from Hugo to now is technology. So we did have a lot of tools that just didn't work. And the fact that we're not preparing, that mapping will require an extensive digital system that it's not, it's not going to work, but it, it has to be powered. One of the first problems we had was lack of communication. Nobody knew where to bring things. Nobody knew how to map things. You have to preload it in terms of a response. And you have to set the parameters that will let you identify the particularities of the rural areas, the mountains, the offshore islands, and things like that. But it will certainly is going to have to have a deep digital indicator or that is resilient with redundancy in communication. There is a yes, there is a group uh, that is I don't know which media because I get emails and notifications too. But it's a group I think it's called Open uh, Regulieres uh, that 
just after Maya Heat, they started to produce masks because they were. And the first one of the proponents was that there was no base map. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and it was in part generated uh, cross sources and here and somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, so I think after that, uh, they have been continued because they keep receiving no notification. So Same. they are sort of filling gaps, at least as base map for things to be worked out. The kind of thing that can be seen in the map, where there are so many others that have to do with the emotion and all that right. there. But there are so many things that they have documented since then, uh, which I think will be a good resource. Okay. If yeah. I were to do a map or conceptual maps, I think the unifying team may be denial. Because when I was doing my research there, what they were saying was clear to me. I felt I was preaching in the desert, you know. It was like, this cannot happen to us. This is Haiti or the Dominican Republic. This is not for the people. I look for a job left, right, and center, and I never got one. I think because jobs are scared, it's scarce there. But on the other side, because for the most part, people believe in officials, that's what reality showed us, were unprepared. They thought this was not going to happen. So this mapping of denial versus reality, and also the denial, for example, of how the federal government treated Puerto Rico immediately, that's a denial of a humanitarian emergency. From throwing paper towels, that's denial of a profound human crisis. Same with the government. So I would map this act of denial versus reality, and I would also map differences, because they were rightly pointing at the differences. So how different municipalities or entities or communities respond to the same problem, that would be interesting for me. It's hard to do, but I think these two things, diverse responses to the same problem and denial, those could be leading lines or narrative of mapping. Uh, in, in terms of um, housing, I was saying that um, where the hurricane entered and also the mountainous um, region, that's where more more homes were affected. So uh, about like 76 percent of homes, and also in the coastal um, regions as well. And I will also look into the poorest um, towns, um, not necessarily in terms of population, but those towns that already were hurting because they already had all informal housing. So for example, the town of Comedia, or something where the river La, La Plata is, all that area got um, floated. So there's there's already like maps that have been done about about um, some of this. And in terms of comparisons, I would say that um, at least like in the case that we were looking at, um, we with like about FEMA and uh, I, I think that for advocacy that could be helpful as well to look into other areas in the United States because then you can see. Um, like where inequity exists, and you can make the advocacy points um, of what happened in other um, circumstances. So I find, um, again, comparisons very uh, useful. Thank you for the presentation, because being in your midst and hearing and feeling all that you went through brings it so closer to my reality than it would watching it on CNN or just hearing about it or reading it in the newspaper. I'm doing research on infrastructural analysis, looking at African-American one-room school facilities. And one of the things that brought me here to this conference today was that the topic, of course, a natural disaster. And just sitting here hearing you say repeatedly um, the concepts of you know, pre-existing conditions and the electrical company and not being prepared. And we it's the same in the past, the future, and we can project for the future. My question is in terms of infrastructure, how would you explain a Cat 5 in Houston same Cat 5 in Puerto Rico. And the devastation is just absolutely phenomenal in difference in everything that you see or speak about. And today, I heard you say something about pre-existing conditions. So knowing Houston, 
I was telling people, and I'm a Texan, you know, I live in New York, but I'm a Texan. And when they were all upset about what was going on in Houston, I immediately said, you know, Houston is going to be okay, because we have three presidents from that state, two living now, seeing Bush and, and, and uh, little Bush. <laughs> they're, they're living there. I mean, I, already, I, I knew that Houston was going to be okay, even with that Cat 5. But when I heard that same Cat 5 in Puerto Rico, I really shudder because of the infrastructure. Now, what is being done to look at, we can be specific. You, this lady over here said you, we can do a lot and, and a little, but in terms of infrastructure, my research looks at schools, roofs, windows, and floors. How would we begin to make sure that schools operate with the infrastructure that you had then and that you have now, and how do you project it changing in the future? That against the backdrop of unnatural disaster. Are we just having a day to eat this food? Or, or can you come up with something? Um, so I, let me see if there are other questions sure. in the room for the last day of the panel. Yeah. No, I didn't want any more questions. Whatever, we have about 10 minutes. So. Yeah, no, quick, <laughs> yeah, I'll say something just after that. Okay, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I would say that the, there was like lack of planning. So the actually plan that was done for emergency response, it was like about a tsunami, and it was a plan that was um, outdated. So um, FEMA wasn't prepared, so it didn't have um, the things that needed in order to respond, even though it, it, it approved um, this plan. So I think that planning um, is like, in terms of emergency, it, it wasn't there. Um, so that's something that, that you you mentioned. Um, in terms of like the infrastructure that existed, we had like, for example, in terms of the um, just the electric um, uh, company, right? So everything was um, outdated, like 50 years ago when investments were made, 80% of like the cables just like fell down. Um, so again, it was the happy the lack of um, investment for a very long time. In terms of the schools, well, that's a interesting piece because the uh, governor just like closed 300 um, schools and the majority in rural um, areas. So in terms of the, the whole like, educational system is being restructured, right? So the question is now what's going to happen with these um, vacant buildings. A lot of people have been doing com com uh, community resilience centers because they um, they can put like power on them, they can um, put cisterns and being ready for another um, emergency. Other people have been thinking it for housing. Um, some people have, people have already have been squatting for a while, right, in, in schools. So we, we have to figure out what to do with all these closed schools. Um, so that's like one piece, piece of it. And in terms of the um, education, education is being completely dismantled. So um, there's a lot of cuts to the University of Puerto Rico and to schools themselves. Um, so that, that seems like another man-made <laughs> disaster. I don't know what is the, the solution in terms of education. What the governor is seeing is like charter schools um, and uh, just like the privatization of the educational system. So that has been kind of like a movement that we have seen in many, many um, other cities. Um, so I, I don't have an, an, an answer, I don't know if anybody does, but I just wanted to mention um, that piece of education. Yes, the, I think that the government has been the real hurricane uh, in terms of education schools in Puerto Rico. Uh, the, like what the, what the hurricane didn't take uh, with it, the, the government has done it. So I, I think that in terms of infrastructure, uh, the real problem there is evidently the, the policies and, and the closing of schools and so on and so forth, rather than the hurricane. 
I think with the Vieques is again a microcosm. FEMA decided that they were going to do a new grid over Vieques that could handle Cat 4s, maybe Cat 5s, and then put some on the ground and put rural utility standards that would withhold that there wouldn't be like a piece from 1960 and another from 1970. That happened on most rural places in Puerto Rico that haven't somewhat changed it. It was just really crappy grid. But when they're presented these options, uh, the electric company wants to have the money to do it themselves, not an outside company from the United States or even other in Puerto Rico. Uh, but they're not trusted by anybody who's funding because they're not known for their money management. Uh, <laughs> uh, but in the schools, in Vieques, for example, we see what is transferable to all that. You would think. You would think they would go to the schools and hook them up and, and, and make them resilient and all that, but that's just not the case. So the answer is like, Puerto Rico has to revisit the entire grid and make it sustainable to categories. And, and the federal government should pay for it if they're smart, because if not, they're going to be rebuilding it all the time. And that's why, I mean, the Stafford Act has to bend a little bit, so you don't have to find these weird sources of money to fix a problem that you know you're going to have. And then you have to apply it to the schools. In Vieques, when Burl came, we were outfitting a school as a secondary shelter because they weren't ready, and the school wasn't ready. private people. Going back to the to the U.S. citizen as the infrastructure of, of travel and mobility, what what about the, Puerto Rico? Is oddly enough one of the places that most of the population votes, like 80 percent, I think. Which is, but then with the new diaspora that been happening on in Florida and the election that just happened. What, what has been the, because that's a really prosaic but very evident way of going about the problems, the policy problems. <laughs> so what, what is the voting rate of the new diasporas getting to Florida and, and places like that and taking advantage of that U.S. citizenship infrastructure to move to places and change those policies through, through the systems that already exist? Uh, I was before I uh, actually I scratch all that part of my paper, but I can tell you what it used to say. Um, I just want to say that a brief answer to your prior question that there's not going to be what you're asking is there going to be a systemic rebuilding of Puerto Rico according to what we have learned? No. 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 What there's going to be is uh, this is a, a good old Marxist concept, the siguali combinado, right? There's going to be an unequal. Uh, a process of rebuilding depending on the resources, uh, networks, and other capabilities of different parts. I think that's what's going under current conditions. Under current conditions. If there was other kinds of political developments, other things might happen. To Libertas, um, question of opinion. No, 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 Following the Florida situation, there's a lot of hope. I think the Florida situation is also the Siguali Combinada. Um, you don't have the same levels of voting anywhere uh, Puerto Rico is in the U.S. than you have in Puerto Rico, and that's because in Puerto Rico, your your job may depend on your vote. It's a whole different reality. It's nothing to do with citizenship or any of that. Um, so, in the, and the other thing, though, is that particularly Florida, I think that's a big question mark. Uh, I, I see reasons to be optimistic and pessimistic about the future of, of Florida, Puerto Ricans politically. On the, on, the, on the optimistic side, we've seen things in Florida happen as a result of Hurricane Maria's settlement that we hadn't seen before, like protests to governors. Like there was a protest, a people protesting Rosselló when he went to Kissimmee and called them Vende Patria, people are suffering, etc., etc. That kind of stuff you didn't, you know, not normally see in Florida. But on the other hand, Florida is a place, and I lived there for seven years, um, is a place where neoliberalism is the lingua franca, is dominant ideology internalized. Uh, you have to pull yourself up from the bootstrap, the government's not responsible for you, etc., etc. Uh, in that regard, um, I, I, I think that in the long term, uh, Puerto Ricans will uh, diversify politically. And although the majority may still be uh, uh, relatively progressive, I think it's going to be—it's not going to be a block uh, the way that some people would like it to be or behave as. Well, I think the opportunity that you're identifying is the only thing that's going to get some policy change here. In Vieques, we didn't get power, so all these people got together, voices were acting for Vieques, and called 32 people in Congress and Senate every day. And the Army Corps engineers showed up in video. That's not the way it should work. But in terms of the policies, 
Because why should we get benefit that we have people calling over Comerito? I mean, I'm glad we got it and we were being abandoned, so it's timely and I kind of feel that it's okay because everybody else is kind of being attended to. But in terms of what you're saying, there is a strong, not only not only the Puerto Ricans who are there, but people who care about Puerto Rico still have Maria in their minds to the elections and to the, that are going to be coming up and to the decision making. So I would make a major push to change some of these policies, to get some of these resources, because it's going to affect the elections if we keep clear into what's needed. We're going to confuse it with political, we could, could keep on infrastructure and improvement and education and all these things very clearly, very single trick pony there. Uh, I think you do have the power with the people who moved to Puerto Rico from to the states and with the people in the states that remember Puerto Rico. But you need a massive organizational, I mean, think about Vieques as an example. Massive invest. A ma you, need, you would need a massive political investment. Or a great movie. <laughs> <laughs> On many levels, uh, you know, in order to do that. Well, I'll just say thanks. I don't want to, you know, just, just to wrap up, but first of all, thank you everybody for an amazing conversation. Um, but I just want very quickly, you know, nobody necessarily needs to answer this, but maybe you have some thoughts. We'll turn to some of the points that Jacob made at the beginning. Um, you all just gave us kind of chapter and verse the neoliberal script in, in one way or the other, including in the Q&A. Uh, and and it, to my mind, you showed us what is not so much exceptional about this particular case, but what's typical about it. Uh, and not just with hurricanes, uh, but, you know, for example, Detroit, we mentioned Flint. Um, sites of dispossession, they usually map onto some kind of either colonial or or other uh, sort of cartographies, uh, Indo-Colonial time kind of cartography or exo. And, and so, the, the, and the, 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 what seems to be new, maybe, uh, is, is this moment of emergency, the, this sort of declaration that all bets are off, and, and most particularly the way that this works uh, on suspending exactly the processes you just described, uh, it is you know, heartening to hear more about you know, the sort of self-governing you know, movements and so on, but, this, but particularly this, the, the, the way in which the democratic institutions are suspended uh, in order for this other restructuring to happen seems to be a plan. So, so in, in a way, I guess one of the things that you've confirmed for me, and maybe you have some closing thoughts, is that not only is the plan not to have a plan, but the point of that is, is to attack directly those institutions and those, you know, popular uh, democracy, even formal democracy, just sort of, you know, <clears throat> that may get in the way uh, of the bankers and, and so on. So at one level, yes, it may be about uh, who's running the show, but they're, 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 that is maybe the more infrastructural element uh, that their operating system running in the background that, that in a sense, drive the whole project, anticipate climate change, anticipate uh, re, uh, you know, uh, economic restructuring, and, and plan accordingly. So uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about that. You don't have to, but... <laughs> I'll add another sort of lesson, certainly, for me, in terms of the overall title and, and perhaps the, the expectations of, of the conversation. Um, certainly there's the issue of the urgencies that, that, that you mentioned. And the other one, which is not to abuse of Russell and Krauss, but it's the idea of infrastructure as an expanded field. That the, the common thought of, of uh, infrastructure as, uh, as the hard um, very, very, very technical underpinnings of the built environment um, to hear uh, the idea of emotional infrastructure, to, um, to, to hear about history as infrastructure you know, that sort of supports sort of the economic systems that, are, that, that sort of underpin um, the trajectory of, of how certain things, um, how we can understand how certain things happen over time. I think that all of those are, uh, and maybe my own public space infrastructure, 
are, are all sort of, sort of uh, uh, enriching the conversation, making it certainly much more complex than, than how, do you fi how, do you, how do you fix grids and how do you um, establish um, um, uh, capacities for the future, but something that is much more, much richer, much more complex, much more wicked as a, as a Gordian knot. Uh, uh, in terms of a problem that, that we have to confront. And, and, and certainly I think it's something, uh, it's a benefit of, of having been here and being able to hear all of those sort of uh, uh, added complexities to, to, to our own very sort of wickedly complex uh, home. Yeah, we'd like to thank you for, for bringing us. I think part of it is what you said. There has to be an organized massive movement that takes the opportunity that Maria brought to the its horror to, to highlight these typical situations and to push for change. So I think you know, the more we all do it in all the different ways, we have a short window, very short window. Okay, thank you everyone. This was amazing.